In June of 2021, the Australian government released a country information report for Malaysia. When I read this report, I learned a lot more about the actual impacts of Islamization on Malaysia and its citizens. Now, obviously, I'm not making this video to deny that there are many Malaysians out there who are living a happy and prosperous life. But the facts remain clear that institutionalized discrimination against several groups is happening throughout the country. I do want to clarify that my intention here is not to suggest that the application of Sharia-based law in Malaysia is representative of how every individual individual Muslim or Muslim country practices Islam. I do acknowledge that Muslims all over the world interpret and practice Islam in a variety of different ways, but it would be dishonest to say that a Muslim country that's enforcing Sharia law, which is derived from the Quran and Hadiths, has nothing whatsoever to do with Islam. We can't just ignore the countries and individuals that are interpreting Islam in a way that is so blatantly harmful, especially when it's happening on such a large scale, particularly within the Muslim world. So just take a deep breath for me. We're not here to generalize all Muslims. What we are here to do is examine the facts to help us understand the impact of Islamization on Malaysia's legal and political system and the effects that this has on its citizens. I'm going to be using a lot of references throughout this video and I'll be sure to include all of those below. So Sunni Islam began to spread in Malaysia in the early 12th century by Arab and Indian traders. At that time, Hinduism and Buddhism were already widely rooted throughout Southeast Asia. By the end of the 17th century, Islam had become the dominant religion in the nation. So what does Islam actually look like in Malaysia today? Let's start with an overview of the current legal and political system. So in Malaysia, the legal system comprises common law, which is administered at the federal level, and Sharia-based law, which is administered at a state level. This means that the application of Sharia law is going to differ depending on the state jurisdiction. But it's important to note that this could soon change in the near future. In 2019, the National Council for Islamic Affairs agreed on a proposal to standardize Sharia criminal law across all states. If enacted, this means that the entirety of Malaysia is going to practice the same Sharia. Article 3, subsection 1 of Malaysia's constitution states that Islam is the religion of the Federation, but other religions may be practiced in peace and harmony in any parts of the Federation. Article 11, subsection 1 also says that any person is able to profess and practice their religion. So although it seems like the constitution is allowing for freedom of religion, there are still numerous legal constraints that are enforced upon those who don't practice Sunni Islam. State governments in Malaysia don't recognize marriages between Muslims and non-Muslims and any children born of such marriages are officially considered illegitimate. Religious minorities face a range of institutionalized discrimination at both legal and societal levels. This includes discriminatory fatwas, raids, and arrests. The National Department of Islamic Development also has a team responsible for investigating complaints of provocations towards Islam. Citizens can make complaints directly using WhatsApp. Islamic groups and leaders have harassed and criticized people who have raised concerns over the growing Islamization of the Malaysian government. In 2019, the United Nations reported that the increasing Islamization in Malaysia was leading to the concealment of Malaysia's history. Non-Muslim cultural heritage and the pre-Islamic history of Malaysia is increasingly being omitted from textbooks. The contributions of Chinese, Indian, and indigenous Malaysians have also been marked the government seems to be under the impression that the only parts of Malaysia's history that matters are the Islamic parts. For people like me who have apostatized from Islam, Malaysia is not the place you want to be. The civil courts in Malaysia have ruled that they have no jurisdiction to involve themselves in apostasy cases. This means that apostasy cases are exclusively handled by Sharia courts. In several Malaysian states, apostasy is a crime punishable by a fine, jail, and caning. While there are two states in Malaysia that prescribe the death penalty for apostasy, federal laws thankfully prevent this from actually being implemented. Formally leaving Islam in Malaysia and having this reflected on your national identity identity card is a near impossible process. If a person wants to officially convert from Islam to another religion, they need to apply to a Sharia court and will often face an extensive legal battle as a result. If a person is successful in this process, then the state will officially declare them an apostate. The US Department of State has also revealed that there are rehabilitation centers for people who try to convert from Islam to another religion or are otherwise accused of apostasy.
According to a 2010 census, atheists make up less than 1% of Malaysia's population. In 2019, Malaysia's former president stated in parliament that atheism conflicts with the Malaysian constitution. He then went on to say that while the constitution does allow for freedom of religion, it does not allow for freedom from religion. He also emphasized that if necessary, the government could impose legal sanctions on those who tried to endorse or promote atheism. In 2017, the Kuala Lumpur branch of Atheist Republic went under investigation by the government. The investigation came about after a picture was taken at the annual general meeting of Atheist Republic and this drew significant attention online. At this point, it's unclear what the conclusion of that investigation actually was. However, the former Prime Minister made it clear that if any Muslims were found to be involved in atheist activities, the State Islamic Religious Department would not hesitate to take action against them. He also said that any ex-Muslims found to be taking part in atheist activities would be counselled whereas anyone who was spreading atheist ideas would be prosecuted. A former minister even called for public support to hunt them down. In a different case study, a woman who was suspected of atheism and deviancy in 2018 was forced to live in an Islamic rehabilitation center for six months. Now, technically compulsory hijab is not mandated within Malaysia's legislation. However, Islamic modesty culture still dominates societal expectations and norms. For the Muslim majority in Malaysia, wearing a headscarf is not mandatory. But the nation has become more conservative in recent years and today, most Muslim women wear one. I launched an online quiz for Muslim women to know their rights. The people who did it put up photos of us. You look at the comments, tudung mana? Where's your headscarf? My lecturer, she, she said that I'm not being Muslim enough because I'm wearing jeans. When Malaysian activist Mariam Lee spoke about her decision to remove her hijab, she was investigated by religious authorities. Malaysian government has come down time and again against Mariam Lee. She was hauled in for questioning under a law against insulting Islam. Women in this part of the world, when they take off their hijab, what happens to them? They get bullied, they get harassed. Even though Section 574 of the Malaysian Penal Code provides a sentence of up to five years for marital rape, the application of this law in practice is weakened because of the way that it conflicts with Sharia law. Sharia law in Malaysia prohibits wives from disobeying the lawful orders of their husbands. This creates a culture that discourages and disempowers women from reporting instances of things like marital rape. I think it's important to note as well that the expectation for wives to be obedient to their husbands is made very explicit within verse 434 of the Quran. People seem to fixate on the argument of whether or not it says to beat your wives, but all the while disregard the fact that the verse as a whole remains blatantly misogynistic regardless of that. We can see the implications of this verse reflected within Malaysia's own legal system. We see that Sharia law is placing a hindrance on the protection of women against violence perpetrated by their husbands. The queer community in Malaysia face both societal and official discrimination. This can include prosecution, re-education, exclusion from employment opportunities and public spaces, and of course, violence. LGBTQ people have been officially banned from appearing in any state-controlled media since 1994. Under Section 377A of the Penal Code, same-sex acts are criminalized, regardless of age or consent. The punishment for this is prescribed in Section 377B. This includes imprisonment of between five to 20 years and whipping. Non-normative gender expression is also criminalized under state Sharia laws. It's not uncommon for state-sanctioned raids to take place at LGBTQ events. For example, in 2018, 20 men were arrested at a nightclub in Kuala Lumpur and forced to undergo counseling for engaging in illicit behavior. In the same year, two women were publicly caned in front of a hundred witnesses just for attempting to engage in sexual intercourse. In 2018, the Minister for Religious Affairs announced that nearly 1,500 people had taken part in a rehabilitation program to re-educate them about their sexual identities. Trans people in Malaysia are particularly vulnerable and at risk of prosecution and violence. A man is obviously must be a man and a woman must be behave like a woman. We have to follow the divine laws and Sharia law. So what does all of this tell us? What do these facts say about the impact of Islamization on basic human rights? Ask yourself this. In the absence of privileges granted under secular Western governments, 
What does political Islam actually look like in practice? In a perfect Islamic state where Sharia law is being enforced nationwide, do you genuinely believe that this is for the greater good of all citizens in the country? Next time you find yourself pondering these questions, I want you to think seriously about the reality that the citizens of Malaysia are forced to endure. Because at the end of the day, I'm sure we can all agree that Malaysia deserves better than an Islamized government, and so does the rest of the world.